my entire house is, is destroyed and everything in it that I had just replaced. But we're alive, we're safe, and that's what's most important. And we're coming together as a community to support each other. And now, live from Jerusalem, you're listening to Israel Inspired Radio. Here are your hosts, Rabbis Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Shalom, you're listening to Israel Inspired on the Land of Israel Network, thelandofisrael.com. I'm Ari Abramowitz here. Jeremy is on the road, winding down what really seems like a life-changing speaking tour for him. I spoke to him last night, but I'll let him share that with you when he returns for next week's program. But I got to tell you, this morning, wow, what a morning. I woke up at 5 a.m., and we went out to plant the second terrace of our vineyards here in the hills of Judea, getting my hands in the dirt, planting these grapevines. It's so overwhelmingly exhilarating. It's so exciting. It's such a privilege. It's such a merit. You know, it was in these hills that the prophet Amos had his visions that transcended time, and it may have been us that he was looking at when he said, Veshafti shvutami, and I'll return my nation, the exiles, to their land, unatatim kramim veshatuat yenam, and they will plant their vineyards and drink their wine. I found myself waving to him. Maybe he's looking at us right now. But uh, so, so, so exciting. But you know, on a, on a less positive note, as I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you, there's been a flood of biblical proportions in Houston, Texas. Now, this is an objective tragedy. It's consuming the entire country as it should. But for me, this is uh, very personal. As many of you know, I was born in Houston, Texas. So was my mother. So was my grandmother. I'm deeply connected to Houston. Sometimes it feels like I'm uh, somehow related to half the Jews in that city. I have uncles, aunts, cousins. Many of them are in Houston right now, which is why it's so particularly painful to see what's happening over there as we speak. You know, the floods have destroyed 80% of the city. It's left death. It's left destruction in its wake. Nine trillion gallons of water have inundated the city. And as many of you have probably seen on the news, there's, there are entire highways, two-tier highways that are completely underwater. Over 7 million residents have been flooded. Just to put this catastrophe into perspective, land-wise, imagine the entire state of Delaware with twice the population of Manhattan underwater. And believe it or not, there's fear that the worst is yet to come. There's 30-plus inches and counting. And they say the rains are going to continue possibly through Friday. I, I can't tell you how many people I've heard from that are experiencing serious PTSD from hearing the raindrops continue to fall on the rooftops, possibly because many of them are stuck in the attic. That's the last place for them to go. They told them to go up there with, uh, with shovels or an axe so they can break through the, uh, and get onto the roof if there's no way out. So I guess it's not PTSD. That would be post-traumatic stress. It's just traumatic stress. It's just happening right now. Whew. Now, I've been spending more time than usual on Facebook trying to see how my friends and my family are faring, although those updates are, are coming to an end, as I imagine people are turning their phones off to conserve their batteries if they're not dead already, because there's no electricity there, and they need to keep them for emergency purposes. But uh, you know, fortunately, I was able to reach some dear friends of mine who have all congregated in the house of the Yaffe family. That's Wayne and Laura Yaffe. They're a sweet, generous, very hospitable couple from a very special Jewish community in Houston, Texas. I know I'm biased, but I, I think it's objectively true. I've known these people for at least half of my life. Now, the Yaffe's had the foresight and the ability to raise their home after the last flood, which brought their home to a height that was just out of the reach of the waters. And when I say raise their home, you have to understand what's involved. It's a massive undertaking, tremendously expensive. Construction crews specialize in, in, in this very thing. They elevate the home and they insert a massive subterranean foundation. Oy, it was, it's a big deal, and only a number of the houses in the community were even able to do this. So fortunately, they were able to do it, and they were able to do it high enough that they just 
dodged this flood. And so there's a, a, a bunch of people from around the community, Jews and non-Jews alike, that are all congregating in their home. But you know what? I'll, I'll let you hear firsthand what's going on. I heard from Michelle Levy in Houston. L- listen to this. We were able to get a boat. We swam over yesterday and got the blow-up boat. And we were doing the rescues on our street. And then yesterday there was an airboat from some volunteers that came in that were evacuating on other streets as well. We were swimming. That was the only way to get to the people. The National Guard has been doing airlift rescues as well for all of the shut-ins, the bed-bound people and, and people that needed medical. The water has just started going down this morning. We can actually start seeing the grass in the sidewalk, but it was above four feet in all of our houses yesterday. It was four feet inside the house. It was about 10 feet in the street. There's four elevated houses on on our street, and we evacuated all of the elderly from our street between the four houses. It was up to the bottom of the front door yesterday at the highest point, and we thought it was going to come in, but it did not. We knew that the hurricane a couple of days ago, but we did not expect it to this extreme probably until late Friday, early Saturday. I actually started taking water into my house at 2 a.m. Saturday night, Sunday morning. My entire house has been destroyed and everything in it that I had just replaced. But we're alive, we're safe, and that's what's most important. And we're coming together as a community to support each other. And then in the same house, I was able to interview Mindy Pollack. Now, she's a friend of the family. The Pollocks are a pillar of the Houston Jewish community. And she her- shares this, this harrowing story. Listen to what she has to say. Our story, our home flooded three times before this in 20 months. And we were up for elevation. They were going to elevate our home. Starting this past Thursday, they were going to elevate it six feet. But because of the inclining weather, they were going to put it off until this week. I moved back all my stuff. We're living in a rental, your rental, where your parents used to live. And I had moved back already. They closed school Friday. So Mitchell's mine. I had nothing to do. I started moving back everything that I could physically carry back and forth into our home because they were going to elevate it. This is on Clifford. They were going to elevate it uh, six feet. We went back to the rental for Shabbos, and there was nothing Shabbos. We went to shul. There wasn't a drop of rain. We were all wondering why did the city close down on Monday. It's a beautiful day. It's sunny. Anyhow, Motzei Shabbos, as predicted, the waters began, and we were still in our rental. And by midnight, I was already told on Cliffwood that because Laura Mitchner lives next door, she is seven feet high, but her garage is my level, and she started getting water in. So I knew that I had some water in. Um, Rabbi Gelman, for some reason, left his car on the street by our rental. He was next door to us now in Deborah Kira's home. He had told everyone to move his car. His, his, his was down there. And already by midnight, you couldn't see the, the lights of the car. And by Sunday morning, the heavens just kept on opening and flooring. And the rental that we're living in never gets in water. And at about 11 a.m., it started filling up with water. By then already, there was over four feet of water outside and going very quickly up to five feet dirty water. The rafts that had passed by already with kids from Barron who were trying to save people, their houses on the other side of Green Willow where we rent, which never flooded, was flooding as well. So they had to go home. And thank God to Mr. Gross, who is a neighbor. He came with his canoe, and he's a a strong guy. He got us both in. He warned us that if we move at all, the canoe can tip over because it's based on weight. And he tried very hard to canoe us down, so you know it's a block and a half away, to Hoffman's house. Unfortunately, the currents were so strong that he could not canoe us there. The canoe itself took us back to our regular neighborhood. We ended up on Meyerwood, and the, which is, and the first house that we could get to to get out of the canoe was Yassi. So we ended up at the Yassi home. And the canoe literally floated up to Yassi's door because Yassi, who's five feet above, had water up to their door. And they are elevated five feet. And so basically what's been happening is you could not – by the way, your home – from what I understand, flooded as well. 
at all night long because I was up all night long. The rains, the heavens opened. It was pouring. It is a stream here. It really looks like a river, literally a river. We're very thankful, Baruch Hashem, that the, the Yafis have been wonderful. It's, we're one big happy family here. They took in people from the block. We're meeting new people. But it, there's a lot of devastation, and the waters are not going down. That's the problem. So when homes are elevated and you're worried about water coming into a home that was elevated five feet, the community is phenomenal. That's the one positive thing from all this, really, the wonderful offices, the caring of everyone. I mean, non-Jews, Jews alike, people I never met before, how can we help you? As we were canoeing down, there were people on top of the roof begging for help to be saved. Now, there, there, was only, there wasn't even room for the three people that were in the canoe, so Mr. Gross, from what I understand, went back and forth saving people, uh, you know, obviously total, total strangers on top of rooftops and all that. It, it was really bad yesterday. And it was the, the fright of not knowing how deep the waters were and what were in the waters. There's no power, and we don't know. We haven't got, you know, the school was closed, I assume, for this week, like HISD. And we don't know yet what the community is going to do as a whole. I'm sure it will only be positive and wonderful. But a lot of homes, all the homes were, homes past Green Willow, where your parents rented, flooded. And those have never flooded in any of the floods. Even though we're covered by insurance, they don't necessarily give it to you. It's the difficulty of trying to not bargain with them, but deal with their stupidity. Well, we're not going to cover this, or, or we can't cover this, or you have to provide receipts when all the receipts are wet and you can't even see them. And it's, I guess, the indifference of certain insurance companies, but not so much the insurance. I guess it's just the devastation of losing everything again and again and again. But with that said, thank God, less is more. They are only things, their only material possessions, and maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to say we don't need all this stuff, and you have to downsize, and now you don't have a choice, because we are downsized, literally down to the food, literally down to the clothes on our back. But Sam is fine, we packed his medicine, and really that's all that counts. Well, well I want you to know that uh, I speak for myself and the Houstonians here in Israel, that we are consumed with what's going on in Houston. We're thinking about you. We're praying about you. We're worried about you. And all right, love you guys. Send my love to everybody there. And I'll tell you, I've been through my share of floods. My family's home have been destroyed a number of times, and I know firsthand the degree of havoc and trauma that these floods leave in their wake. And, and listen, there's two main Orthodox Jewish communities in Houston. And like many places around the world, often Jewish communities refer to their community based on the closest synagogue which the community centers around. Because as Orthodox, they, they keep the Sabbath, and you can only walk to the synagogue. So the synagogue is, of course, the center of the community. So my community growing up, my grandfather was one of the presidents of this community. It's called United Orthodox Synagogues, UOS is what they call it. It's in the Meyerland area. And the, my community there in Houston always gets hit. And this time it's been hit harder than ever. The synagogue is destroyed. It's just destroyed. Eight feet of water. It was nearly submerged in water. And, um, you know, after the floods that happened a couple years back, a good number of the families in my parents' neighborhood, so they, they raised their homes, right, as I, as I mentioned. And uh, this is supposed to make them floodproof, but a number of those have even been destroyed, other than the Yafis, of course. And just a couple of them have narrowly missed the flooding. And uh, hopefully it will remain that way, but they say, we you know, with this more uh, rain to come, hopefully theirs won't be destroyed as well. Oy, that would be such a tragedy because so many people are relying on these few homes that have been elevated. And, uh, you know, the, the community, the UOS community, it gets hit so hard, primarily because it borders right on the bayou which has overflowed. So just keep in mind that what's, what these streets have turned to rivers, and these rivers are filled with sewage, alligators, snakes. I've seen pictures of alligators swimming through the streets on Facebook. Now, you know, the Orthodox community in the Fondren neighborhood, they're called Young Israel. That's the synagogue that they're based around. And uh, they're usually well out of flooding range, and they serve the function very often when these floods happen. They warmly host 
the refugees from the UOS community when, it, when, when it's flooded out. But they've been devastated by a flood as well. Not as badly as UOS, but friends of mine from there said that they were evacuated in these elevated garbage trucks, which are plowing through the river streets to get them to, to safety. Now, many of you have written and uh, been asking about my parents' welfare, and I thank you for asking, and I am so grateful and relieved that my parents made Aliyah when they did a couple months back because picturing my diabetic father hyperventilating in a flooding house is a nightmare that I am grateful that I don't need to contend with because that would be consuming me right now. But nonetheless, uh, I'm completely immersed in following what's going on there in Houston. I'm concerned about the welfare of my friends and my family, which have left behind. I'm concerned uh, with the city as a whole. But believe it or not, get this. There were a number of families that were on their way to the airport to make Aliyah, to make Aliyah late Saturday night when the flood hit. And for now, and most likely for the, at least the next week, they're trapped in the nightmare, which is Houston now. Literally has the gates shut. They just missed that flight for Aliyah. So please, Hashem, they should be able to come here and make Aliyah soon, along with many of the Jews of, of Houston and, and throughout the world in the diaspora and the exile. Uh, just a, a few little stories I want to share with you. My uncle and aunt, Arnold and Laura Wolf, my mother's uh, brothers, Arnold, they were rescued from their rooftop by canoes that are going through the streets and saving people's lives. They're, they're not on the younger side, okay? And my aunt Laura broke her ankle in the process, and somehow they ended up with a boat to get to Park Plaza Hospital where they spent the night in the lobby, which is uh, you know apparently a much better situation than the tens of thousands that are finding refuge in the George R. Brown Convention Center, which I'm sure that other family members of mine that I'm not able to reach, they're stuck in right now. And I haven't heard reports of what's going on there, but I certainly pray that things don't devolve into what we all remember happening in, in New Orleans with Katrina. My uh, dear friend, Michael Kaplan, he wrote me this. He wrote, Ari, this is so devastating. Definitely the worst flood in recorded history for our area. So tragic for so many. So far and wide, there was nowhere to hide. Every tributary is over its banks. The authorities have been slow to respond, but citizens are doing Hashem's work like no other. This is a message I got from my friend in Houston, Harry Brown. Now, he went up to take his daughter to the airport in New York because she was going off for the year to spend it here in Israel. So he wanted to take her to New York to show her off. And uh, so he missed it, but his wife and his daughter were left at home to weather the storm. And this is what he said. He says, uh, they were left behind. Uh, the power was out and the water was so high that they took a few things and they fled up to the attic. At about 7 a.m., neighbors came in a small boat and took them across the street to a two-story house that, uh, that everyone was in. And they spent the night with about 20 people, total strangers, babies, dogs, cats, in a house with no electricity, no running water. Today, the water finally went down, he said. Enough for them to see the house, but the doors are swollen shut. They're going to go back tomorrow to help the process uh, of cleaning and rebuilding. He said it looks like at least five, maybe six feet of water filled the house. He said this. He said, I'm blessed to have th uh, three Eshet Chayel who make me proud every day, women of valor, that means, with strength, wisdom, love, and dedication. On the other hand, I'm filled with the guilt of a husband and father who isn't able to do anything to help. I'm stuck in Newark at least until Thursday because the Houston airports remain shut. Only God knows why this had to happen. Baruch Dayan HaEmet, blessed is the true judge. We will never give up. Um, you know, that's a, it's a theme that I've seen from many of the people in Houston. You'd think that they would just be exhausted from devastation year after year, everything they have destroyed, but there's so much help and love and hope. It really is bodes well for the values of, of the, of the country and definitely for, for Houston. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, the citizens, they're coming out, they're helping each other despite these dangers that are involved. And it doesn't shock me a bit because Houston is filled with kind, God loving, God fearing people, Jews and non-Jews alike. And uh, our thoughts and our prayers are with them. And, you know, many of you remember the show Jeremy and I did about our own harrowing escape from Houston when we were stuck there after Hurricane Katrina hit in New Orleans. Another hurricane was on its way to, to Houston. And what happened in New Orleans was such a debacle of anarchy 
and even murder in that convention center that when there was a storm coming and heading for Houston, well, everybody ran for it. I remember within just 12 hours, all of the gas stations were empty. The supermarkets were empty. The highways were a complete standstill as cars ran out of gas, and there was looting going on throughout the city. I don't know how much there was, but I know it was happening. Yeah, I tried to siphon gas from my neighbor's car with a barbecue gas tube. Um, learned how to do that incorrectly. Uh, we headed the wrong way up a freeway out of Dallas. I remember being in shock at how quickly things devolved. And I, I internalized then to a certain degree how tenuous the whole concept of security is. How these things we put our faith in to protect us can so quickly and immediately disintegrate before our eyes. Well, anyways, Jews of Houston, all of Houston, we love you. We're praying for you. Stay strong. Hopefully in the text of this show, I'll be able to find the right link that, uh, you know, you could click on to help the community there. Okay, now I want to talk about a story which is a small but disturbing example of a greater trend that I see happening with an American Jewry, particularly on the left. So there's this Jewish left-wing think tank called Molad. There's the guy, one of the head guys there, Avner Inbar. He's been calling on American Jews to shun and disassociate themselves from the Israeli Consul General Dani Dayan over his support of Jews living in Judea and Samaria. Oh, it pains me just to share this. Inbar said the Jews in America must, quote, make a choice and distance themselves from leaders, including representatives from Israel, who hold views counter to the left wing agenda. And he said that Dayan's beliefs are not part of a worldview that, quote, we can reconcile with. He even said that if American Jews don't heed his warning, then he and his left wing Israeli friends and American leftist think tankers would sever their ties with them as well. And now I just want this to sink in for a second. These leftist Jews are attacking and excommunicating Donnie Dayan, their own Israel consul general. A Jew from Israel who fought in the Israeli army for nearly eight years. He dedicated his life to the state of Israel. The state that would be the last refuge for these very Jews in a time of crisis. A state whose soldiers would risk their lives to save, save them should they ever be in danger. And you know, I'm thinking perhaps it's even this the knowledge of this unconditionality of Israel that gives them the license to betray their own nation with such perfidy. And, you know, it's interesting. The first words in this week's Torah portion are, Ki milchama aloi vecha, When you go to war against your enemies. Now, it begs the question, it's been asked, why does the Torah need to say against your enemies? When you go to war against your enemies, who, who else are you going to go to war against? Well, I think the answer of why it needs to say when you go to war against your enemies is lies in what's unfolding right now before our eyes because we crazy Jews, super complicated to explain all this. Maybe I'll dedicate a whole show to it. But we need to be reminded that we're supposed to go to war against our enemies, not against our friends, not against Dani Dayan, not against the state of Israel, not against our fellow Jews. We're supposed to go to war against our enemies. But instead, Avner Inbar and his emotionally ill friends are fighting their best allies. And the only unconditional friends they have in the world in hopes of endearing themselves to these left-wing sickos who will never accept them no matter what they do. Case in point, example, Alameda, California. Now, apparently it's this uber-liberal city of Alameda, California with its rainbow flags and its electric cars that is leading the way in America in anti-Semitic attacks. Now, I don't know if you know, 300%, by 300%, American Jews are more persecuted than any other minority in America. And Alameda, California is leading the way. There's been a whopping 30% rise in anti-Semitic attacks there since this same time last year. A synagogue was attacked with rocks, shattering windows, swastikas have been spray painted in the city. A fourth grader was told by one of his friends in the public, in front of the teacher, in front of the class, Hitler should put you in the oven. 
A high schooler was told Hitler should have finished the job. Now, these could be discounted as isolated incidents, but uh, a guy, Sean McFetridge, the superintendent of schools there in Alameda, he said, quote, it seems to me that since January, I've heard reports in ways that we've not heard them before. There is cognitive dissonance. How is this happening here? We have to acknowledge the problem. And we need to, they need to acknowledge it, we need to acknowledge it and see what this is about. Because while it isn't clear who these attacks are coming from in this overwhelmingly liberal city, maybe it's from their local alt-right, although I doubt it. One thing that's clear is that left-wing Jews are falling into the same trap that they've been falling into throughout history. Believing that by turning against Israel, they'll somehow exempt themselves from the Jew haters and Israel haters which inundate the left. Now, you know, it seems like when these waves of Jew hatred comes, it pours in from both sides. Alex Jones, he's a well-known and very popular conspiracy theorist. I forgot what his show is called. But, um, you know, he's starting to shift his tone all of a sudden regarding the Jews. In the past, he didn't seem to focus on all the Jewish conspiracy theories from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to the Illuminati to the Rothschilds, but now he's going there. This is him blaming Jews for an old-school hooded Nazi KKK rally. Check this out. Listen to what he has to say. Yeah, here's, I mean, there's hours of this online. There's so much cussing, I can't play it. Here's a little bit of audio of me like 18 years ago protesting the KKK, there's no big crowd of Antifa there supporting me, and them threatening to kill me, everything else, because, and it later came out that they were federal agents, like I said. It wasn't even real. I mean, quite frankly, I've been to these events. A lot of the KKK guys with their hats off look like they're from the cast of Seinfeld. Literally, they're just Jewish actors. Nothing against Jews in general, but they're leftist Jews that want to you know, create this clash and they go dress up as Nazis. That footage in Austin, we're going to find it somewhere here at the office where it literally looks like the cast of Seinfeld or like Howard Stern in a Nazi outfit. They all look like Howard Stern. Uh, they've almost got a little curly hair down, and they're just up there hiling Hitler. You tell they're totally uncomfortable, they're totally scared, and it's all just meant to create the clash. That's right. The alt-right is a Jewish conspiracy now as well, and the unraveling of America. J you know, just Google the name Jared Kushner and see what comes up. The sheer number of videos and articles about how this Jew Kushner is running the show, running the whole country like a puppeteer. There's so many more examples. I don't, I don't want to get lost on that right now. But I, I do want to say before we wind down this program that um, I, I got some very interesting feedback from last week's program from Charlottesville to Barcelona. What's the state of diaspora jury? That was the program this past week. The feedback has been overwhelming. Now, many of the responses were people expressing their agreement and encouraging me for sharing such an unpopular message. Um, and I'll get to a few of those. But let me first share some of the more colorful responses I got, which unfortunately bolster the very point I was trying to make. One listener wrote this. Jews will continue to be hated so long as they keep trying to subvert and destroy non-Jewish societies. Next time the Goyim lose our patience, there will be no escape. Next time the Holocaust will be real. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. Another listener wrote, Maybe if God's chosen people stopped flipping with everyone, and I replaced a word there, they would stop being forcefully, forcefully removed from their host nations. Another listener wrote, just imagine how big alleged Jew hatred, quotes, would be if Jews didn't control what gets put up on JewTube or what gets opined in the New York Times or what Donald Trump's speeches might neglect to say in reference to Jewish power. Just imagine how mainstream it would be for whites everywhere to react against the parasitical Jew. Jew, you think you're afraid now? Just wait. The fire rises. Another listener wrote on um, shifting tones. He wrote, Let, let's be honest. This is clearly a Jew that wrote this. Let's be honest. They all hate us. On the right, the left, Muslim, Christian, white, black, and brown. The sooner we, get a, we grow a set, stop begging the world to like us and, and please let us stay in our God-given land, the better off we'll be. To all my Jewish brothers and sisters, it's time we stop bickering amongst ourselves. Orthodox, conservative, and reform and pull together or the unthinkable will happen again. Support Israel, each other, and don't hide. Don't hide. Take pride in who we are. 
So that's from clearly uh, from a Jew. Now, uh, this is from uh, one of the listeners on the network. He wrote, we're Gentile supporters of the people and land of Israel based on the Tanakh and not political. We remember Hashem's promises to Abraham, Genesis 15, 8, Isaac, Genesis 28, 13, Jacob 31, 3, Moses, Exodus 19 to 24, King David in the book of Samuel 2, and many others, and many other people that the Jewish people and the land will be preserved throughout history. The Ezekiel 33 watchman on the wall is required work. It's not popular, but necessary to protect people from the physical and spiritual harm from an, from an enemy. We found the people and messages from the Land of Israel Network is like a watchman on the wall. We pray for Hashem to physically and spiritually protect you, your spouses, kids, and extended families in the Land of Israel. It is like the faithful remnant in the Tanakh Book of Malachi. They stayed faithful to Hashem in spite of the decline around them. Another person wrote, I've always understood that Jews from all nations are supposed to return to the land in the last days and dreaded the day it would be, uh, dreaded the day when it will be the time for American Jewry to return because it seems that pain is the only motivator for many. As an American Christian, I realize that this will be a painful time for our country and that I, as a lover of, of all things Israel, will more than likely have to endure my own persecution. As I study patterns in time, I feel there will be something big to happen in Israel in 2017 through 2018, and it could very well be the huge rise of anti-Semitism all over the world. Ultimately, Israel will be the big winner, and we will be the losers. Love the Land of Israel Network. All right, I'm going to stop the listener feedback here, but I think that two polar opposite responses are what tends to happen when historically the tides of history shift for the Jewish people when the winds change. And there are those who double down, whose dormant Jew hatred gets loud and violent. And there's always that small remnant whose love for us is amplified and step up all they do to protect and defend the Jewish people. Now, friends, we're living in, in special times, in potent times, um, exciting times. We can't just sit back and watch this play out. I'm not gonna sit here and tell people what to think and what to do, but I can say, that this is the time for courage and it's a time for honesty and by honesty i mean honesty with ourselves sticking our heads in the sand cognitive dissonance self-delusion these are not luxuries we can any longer afford so stay connected friends with your questions your thoughts you can email me at ari at the land of israel.com i spoke to jeremy he's winding down his trip he'll be back hopefully safely before shabbat shalom from the hills of judea This week on the Yishai Fleischer Show, Yishai meets up with Congressman Brian Mast in Jerusalem. Why it's so important to have that relationship between the United States of America and Israel.